All right, good evening. Let's all stand and sing, Oh Great God. Great God of highest heaven, occupy my holy heart. Own it all and reign supreme, conquer every rebel power. Let no vice nor sin remain. That resists your holy war. You have loved and purchased me. Make me yours forevermore. I was blind. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. You know, our work, uh, the Bible tells us in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Steadfast means you're going to be standing strong in the midst of opposition, unmovable. The Bible tells us in Psalms chapter 1 that uh, the ungodly are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. And boy, it just, they just follow every wind of popularity. But as a believer, we're to be unmovable. Uh, always, I like this part, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Not always surviving the work of the Lord. Sometimes as, uh, <laughs> as Christians, we got this, well, I made it, but God wants us to abound in the work of the Lord. Well, how can we do that? For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And that's why it's so important for us to do whatever we do. Everything we do should be done heartily to the Lord not into men. Because the reality is, and I don't preach a whole message on this, but the reality is when we sow our good works for the glory of man or for the sake of man, the truth is there's a reward to that. In heaven, if it's good works, you're going to receive a reward, but it's going to be wood, hay, and stubble. That's going to burn up. 
But if we do it for the sake of the Lord and for His glory, it's gold, silver, precious stone. And you're going to have that. Here's my belief. Some people, I think, have this idea they're going to be polishing their crown in heaven. I think we're going to cast them at His feet. And uh, um, you ever been in that position where maybe, maybe it's Christmas and everybody was giving all these things and you're sitting there going, I wish I had something to give. I think in heaven we'll be glad for the works that we've done for the Lord. Be in prayer for our missionaries. We'll, we'll introduce our new uh, line of uh, focus uh, coming Sunday. But keep our missionaries in your prayers. And then personal prayer request. Personal prayer request. I thought I saw a hand. That was my son trying to climb the wall. Yes, Mama. Yeah, keep praying for Uncle Donnie. That's my um, dad's older brother. He uh, is battling several sicknesses, really, but... They're kind of they're kind of related with kidney uh, disease and uh, also with cancer in the blood as well. So pray for Uncle Donnie, Miss Vicky. Okay, so pray for Mr. Steve and his family. We'll do it. We'll do that. Miss Linda? Oh. Okay. Is she back here for now? Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah, so... Maybe pray a little more fervently, even for her. Mm. Yes. So she's still in the hospital now. Okay. <laughs> the insurance always wants them to go. And uh, so daughter's making sure she stays until they get a word from the oncologist, then she'll be going home. And uh, is that when you're probably going to, when she goes home? Uh, yeah, she goes home okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Wasn't ready. So we'll pray for her. And remind me her name? Pat Clayman. That's right. I've been praying for Brother Blau's sister because I couldn't remember her name. <laughs> Thankfully, God knows who your sister is, but Pat Kleeman. So pray there. Caleb? Oh, okay. It's, it's his, uh, his little, little doll. It's, it's uh, going to get better, I think. Miss K, unspoken request. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you. Lord, we're truly grateful that, Lord, first of all, we can have a relationship with you. And Lord, as we look at our relationship with you, there's a lot of different ways that we can look at it. But Lord, I'm grateful that it's a relationship that, not to any of our credit, but Lord, all solely to your credit, is a relationship in which we can bring our cares before you. Not just because it's the practical or the, the, the normal thing to do or the required thing to do, but because you actually care. Not only do you care, but Lord, you have the power to work in these situations that were given tonight. Several people dealing with some very serious health issues. I think of uh, Uncle Donnie. I think of uh, Brother Blau's sister. Uh, I think of um, Miss Sandy. I think of these that are facing very difficult sicknesses, but Lord, you have the power to help them through and go through the difficult times and the difficult treatments and the difficult days. And Lord, you even have the ability to heal them. And Lord, I pray that you'll work mightily in their, in their life and in their health. I think of Mr. Steve and losing a, a loved one. And as they travel and as they go through the funeral and the grieving process, I pray to Lord that you'll be with them and give comfort. I pray for Michael, I pray that you'll help him and guide him and give him wisdom and strength. I pray to Lord for um, 
and the many challenges that, Lord, are represented as we live our lives. And, Lord, I pray that indeed we'll live them for your glory. And I pray, to Lord, that we'll rely on you. And then, Lord, as we'll see tonight, we'll abide in you. And that, Lord, you may get glory not only out of, out of our, our mess, but, Lord, even through us. I pray, to Lord, that as we will uh, live according to your plan and according to your will, and that, Lord, will glorify you, our Father in heaven. I pray, dear Lord, that you'll guide us. Lord, be with us over these next few moments as we open your word. I pray you'll teach us, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. And we finished up Proverbs last week. And as I said, we probably could start back over and have a whole nother, I don't know how many ever months of, of lessons from it. Because uh, it seems like, well, first of all, the Bible is unsearchable meaning that you can keep searching and searching and uh, finding and finding. I hope you're enjoying reading through the book of James. James chapter 1 is our text for the week uh, to read and study. I've had several thoughts, I just had, and I thought about sharing them on, on Facebook. I just hadn't taken the time to uh, pull my phone out and shoot a video. Um, but uh, I've got several things as you go through James chapter 1. It's not a long chapter, but boy, there's a bunch in there. And uh, such good stuff. I encourage you to continue reading and studying. We're going to John chapter 15, and over the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at this thought of abiding in Christ. Abiding in Christ. John chapter 15, let's begin reading in verse number 1. This is Jesus speaking, this entire text. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. There are thousands, if not millions, of words in the English language. We use all sorts of them, depending on where you are in the United States. You'll use different ones. There are words in the English language in the South they've never heard of in the North. And there are words in the north, we wouldn't have a clue what they are here in the south, though they're still English. It's amazing how you can travel around the United States. We all have the same language, but I'm not sure it's quite 100% the same. Uh, one of my favorite movies of all time is Sergeant York. Uh, Gary Cooper played in it. It was a, it was a movie that was made uh, for the World War II effort uh, to try to boost morale for people to enlist into the army as they needed soldiers. And uh, he was just a country boy from Pall Mall, Tennessee. And uh, he was a rough man who lived a very degenerate life until he got saved. And not long after he got saved, World War I, we entered into it, and uh, he got drafted. He didn't want to go to war. He was a conscientious objector to the war, but eventually did go to war and uh, was a war hero from Tennessee. Uh, if I got my numbers right, he captured 132 Germans, uh, took out 35 machine gun nests during the war, and uh, was a war hero. But with that being said, there's a, there's a part of the movie, and I don't know that the movie's 100% real to life, but um, one of the guys asked him about speaking English. He said, oh, I don't speak any of that. I speak American. <laughs> and uh, he didn't know the difference. He didn't know the difference at all. And there's a lot of different words. Words take on me time, if you will, takes on new words. There's literally a council that will decide whether or not things people use as words will become formal language or acceptable language. And uh, there's all sorts of words that we use. But more than likely, the word abide is probably not one you've used a lot in the last few weeks. Now, we've used words like, let's go, let's hurry, and this morning, well, pretty much every morning, I'm saying, let's go, let's hurry up, that sort of thing, because we live in a society that's go, 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 go. We're always on the move. I speak as a person that I'm on the move a lot. But the reality is, in the Bible, we find a very important word, a word that tends to escape us, and we find it in this text, and we're going to spend some time talking about it over the next several weeks, and it's this word, abide. Webster defines the word abide this way, to remain or to settle down. 
And if we're honest, now there may be some, you say, I'm good at settling down, I'm not good at going, but many of us, we struggle with this thought of settling down, resting. I speak as a person that's guilty. I have trouble resting sometimes. You say, why? Because I feel like I need to be doing the 137,000 things that I've got running through my mind, and I struggle sometimes with this thing called rest. I think some of this is due to our culture. Our culture places an emphasis on always being busy doing something. And can I say this? There's nothing wrong with being busy. Unless, as we'll find from this text, it takes us away from abiding. Abiding specifically in Christ. As Americans, as you look at Americans, and we can look across the world, but we're Americans. Americans are on the move. Sometimes it's from relationship to relationship. Well, you see that in society. Sometimes it's from state to state. Sometimes it's from company to company. Unfortunately, sometimes it's from spouse to spouse, and from times it's from church to church. Always busy. And the tragedy in all of this is oftentimes it's the same way in relationships, spiritually speaking, that fewer people are abiding in a close-knit relationship with Jesus Christ. One of the things that I find more impressive today is people who just stay. People who get consistent and just stay. I remember years ago, uh, someone had, had come through and, and uh, they were busy building their resume. And it was all about, they literally on purpose would get a new job every year to, to build a resume. And there's nothing wrong with necessarily building a resume. But there used to be a time when I would hear somebody make a statement Maybe a preacher. We'll use a preacher for example. Preacher make a statement. I pastored seventeen churches. <laughs> you think, man, that's impressive. And I've learned over the years. I'm more impressed by, like a brother Jim Tedder who pastored only one church, but he did it for fifty eight years. It's impressive. The more I hear of people who've who've maybe been at one place, and what it tells me about them is they have a, a word that may not also be in the dictionary, but a stick to it in Have you ever heard that word before? Probably not, because I probably said it wrong anyway. But the Lord Jesus is speaking these words. And no fewer than eight times in this passage, He tells His disciples, whom He's speaking to, to abide in Him. He's calling for these disciples to remain, or if you will, settle down in a relationship with Him. Here's one of the issues with us when we're on, our, when we're on the go. You ever seen a kid that's stressed out? And by kid, I mean a little baby. You know what they do? Wah! I mean, they are a mess. They're throwing a fit. And you know what they need? They need to be in the arms of their parent and their parent to say, shh, 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 shh. Now, I'm not talking about a kid who's just throwing a fit because they're, they wanted something and didn't get it. I'm talking about one who maybe they've been on the go. Now, at, at some point, we, we can't use this as a reason anymore. But if you ever meet a toddler that just needs a nap, boy, you can come up with all the reasons and all these issues this kid has, but really all the kid needs is a nap. You can get that kid to go to sleep. That same kid will wake up a couple hours later and be a total different kid. And can I say this? Sometimes in life, we're like that little toddler that needs a nap. Now, some of you are looking at me tonight going, hey, man, I'm wore out. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> but... If you do fall asleep, I won't throw anything at you. But it's one of those things, unless you're my kid. Anyway, but no, no, I won't. I'm just teasing my, my kid chuckled. But no, I won't. But the truth is, that's not what I'm talking about tonight. I'm talking about settling down in Christ. Learning to rest in Him. I'll be honest with you, sometimes we look at resting as being a weakness. But it's not. Rest is important if you expect to have any strength. And you hear Christ here as He calls each of us to remain or settle down. By the way, let me say this. He wants it to be normal and natural. I'll be honest with you. As I look at this tonight, and I know it's speaking in the context of, of a spiritual rest, but can I say, sometimes we don't make this normal enough. And if we're not careful that we don't make it normal enough, then it becomes this thing that, if you will, is almost a once-a-year thing where we have a time of renewal, and then we got to chug along the rest. But God wants this abiding in Him to be normal and natural. 
He wants us, if you will, to settle down with Him on a day-by-day and a moment-by-moment basis. This is not something that is held for Christmas or Easter or some vacation time, but a daily thing. So as Jesus spoke these words, and these are the words of Jesus, He was on His way to a very difficult time in His life. He was headed to the Garden of Gethsemane. He was about to be arrested. He was about to then shortly after that be crucified, but... As he walked from the upper room to the garden, there was a time. This is one of those last moments, if you will. This is kind of, if you will, Jesus' deathbed conversation with his disciples. And he says he's headed toward the cross. Quite possibly, they were surrounded by vineyards, which would have served as a visual conversation, a visual representation. Jesus, during that time, was not in a time of technology where he could pull up a screen and say, Disciples, I'm going to give you a PowerPoint presentation. But what Jesus often did was he used that which was around him to be a visual as he taught the disciples. I was talking to a man uh, several years ago, probably a good eight years ago, and he was also a preacher. You know what preachers do when they get around a lot? They talk about what they have in common. Now, a lot of times they do. Uh, I have one preacher friend, pretty much all of our messages back and forth are memes, but that's a different story as we also sometimes commiserate together. But we were talking and we have something in common. And as we have this in common, one of the things we have in common was preaching. And I asked him a question. I said, man, have you ever told a story? And in your mind, it was going to work wonderfully to illustrate your point, but it just doesn't. And I kid you not. He goes, no. God didn't call me to tell stories. He told, called me to preach. Just as, and at first I wanted to laugh because I thought he was joking. I realized he wasn't joking. And, and I wanted to go into my defense, but I didn't. I let it go. But one of the things I find about Jesus, Jesus did tell stories. And he told these stories not for the purpose of just telling stories or entertaining people. He told these stories to teach a lesson. And here, as he's headed to the garden, he's taking a few final moments with his disciples. And he was inviting them to something bigger than just a surface relationship. We've got a lot of people, and sometimes if we're not careful, we're guilty as well, in the United States of America that have a very surface level relationship with Jesus Christ. It is their title, it is their thing that they tout, but it's not something that is deeper than a surface level relationship. He's not in this passage inviting them, if you will, to try Jesus. See what it might be like. This was not a 30-day trial in which you can try it, and as long as you cancel before the 30 days, then you won't be charged. No, this was a deep relationship to personally abide with Jesus Christ. Let's discover, if you will, and we won't get through all of this, of course, tonight. We'll get through a portion of how we can abide in Christ. First of all, I want you to notice He starts by explaining the supremacy of his presence. Look at verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Of all the possible relationships we have in the world, there is no relationship that is to be preferred over our relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, that's making a very high statement. This means that your relationship with your, uh, with your spouse is not to take precedence over your relationship with Jesus Christ. Your relationship with your family, whether it be your parents or whether it be your children or whether it be your brother or your sister or anyone else or your church family is not to take precedence or priority over your relationship with Jesus Christ. And naturally, objections sound out. What do you mean? My most important relationship was with my spouse and it needs to be. And if it's not, then there's going to be problems. But understand this, if you prioritize your relationship with the Father, with Jesus Christ, over all your other relationships, can I tell you this? It will help your relationship with your spouse. And it'll help your relationship with your parents. And it'll help your relationship with your children. And it'll help your relationship with your employer. But just because you've got a good relationship with your spouse does not mean you're going to have a great relationship with Jesus Christ. And if we put this relationship in its first place, it, it's not to say these other relationships aren't important. Did you know as you read through the Bible, you find a great emphasis on these other relationships? But our first priority is our relationship with Jesus Christ. Why is that? Well, first of all, His presence can bring what no human can provide. 
You know, there are a lot of times I might arrive on a very terrible scene. And in my short life, there have been times where I've, arri- I've arrived on a very rough scene where I'll be honest with you, I don't have much to offer. I noticed today on my memory, it was three years ago, it seems like forever ago, but it was three years ago that Miss Holly uh, had her accident, and uh, some of you uh, aren't aware of who that is, but it was a family that attended our church at the time. They've moved since. She had a very terrible car wreck, and I'll be honest with you, when I got there Memorial Day weekend <laughs> to Vanderbilt, I'll be honest with you, I thought there was no hope. And sure enough, get down to the hospital, and she had had to be life flighted in, and then I had to go pick up her husband at the at the uh, truck stop because he was three hours away when all of this was found out of what had happened and so forth. And I'll be honest with you, that night and into the next morning at Vanderbilt, I didn't have much to offer. I wasn't filled with some great intellectual knowledge. I'll be honest with you, absolutely none of this was covered at Bible college. None of it. There wasn't a blooming thing I learned at Bible college that I'm like, let me pull out my notes and go through what I ought to do. I didn't have a clue what to do. Can I tell you who was a great help to me that night? The Holy Spirit. Man, I'm driving down the road, headed to Alabama because we thought she was in Alabama, and I'm calling all these different people. I didn't have a clue who to call. When I called the highway patrol, you know what I got? Thank you for calling. We are, our offices are closed for the holidays <laughs> if you need help. And you can't just call some random person and get information about what's going on. And man, I began to call different people. I called Jessica, uh, Miss uh, Tammy's daughter and Miss Linda's granddaughter because she had connections. And boy, we eventually found out she wasn't even where we thought she was. I had to turn around and head to Nashville. And man, I had no clue what to do. I had nothing to offer. When I went and picked up Brother Chester from the, from the um, PA truck stop or whatever truck stop it was at, I didn't have anything to offer him. But I had someone to remind him of. That was God the Father. We could go to him. There have been other situations that I face where I show up on the scene and as a person, I don't have much to offer. One man, I had to give him some very bad news. You know what I had to offer him physically? I was able to catch him before he crumbled in the floor. That was it. But I had somebody that I could connect him to. They could offer much more than I can offer. And the truth is, as time goes on, there's something I realize I don't have a lot to offer and of myself. But there is a relationship that you can have whose presence can bring what my presence can. And his name is Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus began his invitation by identifying himself as who he is, the true vine. Can I tell you, there are people who will try to present themselves as if they are something that, I'll be honest with you, they're just not. But Jesus is the I am. I want to talk just for a few moments of who this I am is. Notice he says, I am. Those two words are more than just a subject and a verb. (laughs) Here in a couple of days, my students in my classes, they have their final exam. and Boy, they are excited about them. They're not. (laughs) We get to have a field trip tomorrow, and then they get to come back to school on Friday and have their final exam. And One of the things they'll have to do is identify what words are and why they're there. This is the subject. This is the verb. What kind of verb is it? Is it a linking verb, an action verb, a helping verb, a being verb? And now you're having flashbacks to when you were in school and you said, I'm done with that. But can I tell you, these words here, I am, is more than just presenting himself as a subject and a verb. Jesus is not presenting himself as merely another way or another option. The words I am are very significant in Scripture. And it's important for us to understand this. Because as he's speaking, they understood this. Very simply, he is, as the great I am, everything we need. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. 
I find in this text, he didn't say I was. He didn't say go and tell them, hey, he who was sent me. No, he said, you tell them I am sent me. Can I say this? The same God that said I am in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus said in the New Testament to the disciples, I am. And I love this. He said, I am that I am unto Moses. He said, I exist that I exist. No one made me. No one can stop me. No one can keep me from doing that which needs to be done. He is the great I am. He is everything they needed. He is everything that Moses needed. He is everything that the disciples needed. And can I say to you tonight, He is everything that you need. Everything. Jesus said, I am the true vine. He was claiming His deity. Notice that Jesus used this powerful phrase throughout the book of John. In John chapter 6, verse 35, he said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. If you're hungry, he's what you need. If you're thirsty, he's what you need. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus spake again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth after me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life. Can I say, if you're in the middle of darkness, you know what you need? The light of the world. Now, I think of a quote Brother Jim said many years ago, and it stuck with me. He said this. He said, if you find yourself in the middle of darkness, he said, then you must not be shining your light. And boy, it's easy for us to say, man, everywhere I look, it's dark. Well, how about shining the light? You know, if you're in the middle of the woods and it's not very dark, it might be time to hit the... It's very dark and there's not much light. It might be time to turn that light on. <laughs> it might be time for us to sing the song we sang as kids and mean it, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Won't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. You're welcome for not going right to the microphone. <laughs> Used to drive me crazy. People go, this little light of mine. Won't let, they, won't let Satan, and they go right in that microphone, and I just cringe. But the reality is, Jesus is the light. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 9, this was the text where I preached my first sermon from. I wasn't called to preach yet. I don't even remember it. My dad does. I was about five years old. I was in Franklin, Kentucky, and we were staying there. I don't know if that was when we lived in the truck or when we lived in the trailer. But it was one of the two. That was about a two-year span. We lived in an 18-foot box truck <laughs> with signs by Covell Keenum on them. The front, if I remember correctly, says, prepare to meet thy God. <laughs> and one on different verses on each side. But I preached this sermon, John chapter 10, verse 9. Jesus said, I am the door. My brother, my sister, myself, we got off into the... They have a little fellowship hall there. And it was during a week. There was no church services going on, but we decided to have our own church service. And we did. And I preached, I am the door. But if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pastor. Can I tell you this? If you're going to get to the Father, you're going to, make, you're going to go to heaven, you've got to go through the door. And Jesus is the door. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. If you're going to get to heaven, you're going to get to the Father. You've got to go through the way. Jesus is the way. By the way, I want you to understand this. Jesus' statements are definitive. They are powerful. They are exclusive. Jesus wasn't asking questions here. I think too often we have leadership that's questionable. I heard someone say, you know, ISIS. If you, if you put it in verb form, it was is, is. <laughs> And they said if ISIS had been in the time of Reagan, there would have been no is, is, it would have been was, was. <laughs> and I understand what they meant by that. But can I say this? Jesus didn't say I was. Jesus said I am. I'm glad to know that Jesus isn't a I was, but he is the I am. His claims are supreme. And when you enter into his presence, you're entering into the greatest presence of the universe. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't think there's anything wrong with getting excited when you see a celebrity. We went to um, 
Dollywood. We went to Dollywood, and you'll forgive my thoughts. I'm, I don't know. The longer I preach, the less I feel good. <laughs> I woke up this morning and feel good. I felt good most of the day, but I guess maybe right now it's the devil fight because the more I preach, the less I feel good. But we went to Dollywood on Friday. It was a trip for the school. It was a fundraiser trip that they won this as a prize if they sold enough. <laughs> and uh, some people go, why would you do that? You're losing money. Now, when you offer a kid a prize, it's amazing what they'll do. But as we were getting ready to leave, my boss, he went into, I think, the gift shop or something, and he ran into Rick Barnes, head coach at University of Tennessee. And he was excited about it, and that's cool. He talked to him for a minute, took his picture with him. A few years ago, we had some other people. They were excited because guess who was at Dollywood? Dolly Parton. <laughs> she was coming through, and they were doing a thing, and kids could care less. It was all the parents and grandparents were like, guess who's here? <laughs> guess who I saw? And uh, you've probably been there before. You see a baseball player, basketball player, somebody. And wow, you're like, guess who? Guess who I saw? I was standing right next to them. Look, they took my picture. And you get excited about it. I remember when I was a kid, we went to Atlanta. We went to a ball game. We just knew we were going to get somebody important signature. And we, I guess, did. Tony Graffinino, if you're watching this message, you're important to God. He was not who we were. We were John Smoltz, Tom Glavin, Greg Maddox. You know, we had all these people. We got Tony Graffinino's signature. <laughs> and I'll be honest with you, as a kid, we were excited to get that. But can I say, when we enter into the presence of God, you're entering into the greatest presence of the universe. And if by believers, if we would understand this, if we would apply this, understanding not just to our practice, but to our heart. I read something on Twitter the other day. And I'll be honest with you, it was kind of like a, mm, they got a point. They said if on our social media we said as much about Jesus as we did about politicians, People might see where our allegiance lies. And it was one of those that's like, <laughs> I got a point. I wonder if Jesus showed up. And there was a meeting in Lewisburg on the square. Jesus is going to be there. I wonder if as many people would show up as if they said Donald Trump was going to be there. Now I know this is the Bible Belt. Of course they would. I'm not convinced. Because you know what? He's been waiting to hear from us for a long time. And he says, I am the true vine. My father is the husband. Jesus is the true vine. The word true means he is authentic. He is genuine. Can I say there are many self-proclaimed saviors? There are many man-made religions, but Jesus is the only truth. If we as branches are going to gain sustenance and life from a vine, we must abide, abide in the true vine. Some people say it doesn't matter what vine you abide in or which religion you're part of as long as you truly believe. They say it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you really believe it. But the truth is, Jesus said, I am thee. That's singular, one way. He is the true vine. Jesus' claims in this passage and throughout the New Testament were exclusive. He excluded every other religious way to heaven, and he claimed this to be the only true vine. He's the only true vine. Jesus stepped forward on history's pages, and he said, Listen, oh, many people will say they're the vine, but I'm the true vine. Believers should share the life of the vine. In this analogy that Jesus used about the vine, the branches represent the lives of the believers, people who share life from the vine. 
As we look at this, before we go any further, I ask you this question. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your only Savior? And I know. You're like, of course, it's Wednesday night. Can I say this? I've learned this truth. Never, ever just assume that someone's saved. There are a lot of people who honestly think they're saved because of who they are, where they've been, and what they've done. And if you believe you're saved tonight because of who you are, what family you were born into, what your parents said or what so-and-so said, that's not salvation. Salvation is believing in Jesus Christ and Him alone to have paid the price for your sins, to be buried and to resurrect from the grave so that you can believe in Him and Him alone for salvation. There's a preacher, Brother Curley, was his name, Brother Mike Curley. Wore a big old cowboy hat. What? Not he's not. I say war. He's still alive. So my my students sometimes think all the people I talk about in my stories aren't alive. I'm like, no, I know live people too. Brother Curley, I've honestly only been around him a handful of times. Every time I've been around him, one. He's taught me something. Two, he probably didn't do it on purpose. <laughs> He's not one of these men to look down his nose and go, now, son, let me teach you something. <laughs> that, that's not who he is. Very humble man. One day we were sitting there at the table for a meeting over at Victory. And he looked at the, across the table at me. He said, now, Josh, let me tell you something. He didn't say it to be, he didn't use my first name to be disrespectful. That's, that's the name my parents gave me. He said, let me tell you something, son. He said, always tell the story. I said, what are you talking about? I wouldn't be disrespectful either. I just didn't know what he was talking about. He said, son, you, you probably think when you get up there to preach, you can say it's like it's in such and such story and everybody's just going to know. He said, I've learned something. They don't. He said, tell the story. Now, I try to do that. I'm not perfect at it. Sometimes I'll say, it's like Daniel in the lion's den. And somebody out there probably doesn't know what I'm talking about. But I learned something in the middle of that conversation. Don't assume what people know and what people believe. So before we go any further in this text and in this series or in this sermon, I ask you this, do you know? Do you know that you're connected through salvation to the vine? If you don't, as Paul would say today, is the day of salvation. And if you do, I ask you this. Are you settled in him? Or are you like that toddler that, boy, you've just been overstimulated? You're... Now, there's two, there's two ways you can be overstimulated. One, you can be overstimulated because you had too much caffeine. You may have been there before. I knew on Friday, I had, to, we got up, I had to get up early. We left Shelbyville at 6.45 in the morning, and I drove all the way there. So before I left, I had me a big cup of coffee. And before we left Dollywood and before we ate supper and before all that, I got me another big cup of coffee because I knew I had to drive all the way home. And I was just fine on the way home. I was. Got home, had no trouble driving, had no issues. The kids went to sleep, which was nice since I had my coffee. Had I not had my coffee, it might have been scary had they gone to sleep, not talked to me. That was okay. But have you ever had too much? I was good that day. I had, had just the right amount. But have you ever had too much? <laughs> I, uh, several months ago, I started working out. And there was this free samples for this pre-workout. And uh, I got it. It was free. I took one of those pre-workout things. It's got caffeine in it. It's like having a big cup of coffee. And I was good. Had me a good workout. It was great. 
Well, the next time, I had the second sample. I put it in a thing. I took a drink. Man, I got to the gym, and I'm like, I don't know if this is good or not. I hadn't even started lifting weights yet, and I was sweating. And I tell you what, I was, I was, whew, I was moving, didn't mean to, you know, and, and uh, so forth. I got that package out. That thing had two and a half times the caffeine the other one did in it. I'm like, I will never, ever, ever, ever do that again. It was some rough stuff. Sometimes you're, because of that, but sometimes it's just you're worn out. Have you ever had your nerves just seem like they're fried? you got to settle down. Like a mother takes that little kid and says, come here. Shh. God wants you to come into his presence so that he can settle you. And if you're like me, this world can fry your nerves. If you feel like everything's just wonderful, it's probably because you're abiding in Christ. Now, that doesn't mean everything's not bad. And there's not all this stuff going on. But when you're in, your pre- in His presence, you're not worried about all the other things. doesn't mean they don't need to be handled. I think of the story, and I'll close with this. Think of the story of Mary and Martha. One sister, she's in the kitchen slaving away. She's making sure everything's perfect. She's, she's nervous. <laughs> I can picture her right now. Boy, she's, oh, we got to get this done. 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 Jesus in another room, he ain't worried about all that right now. Jesus, did, Jesus never walked into Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house. I don't, I don't believe he did. Walked in and goes, oh my goodness, I can't believe you don't have placemats out. I'm coming by today. I don't think he did. By the way, I think sometimes we worry too much what everybody else thinks. And they ain't normally even thinking about it. They're just happy to be there. But she's, she's worried about everything. And the more she works, the more upset she gets. You ever seen somebody like that? The more they do, the more just, oh, no. They're going to be here in five minutes, and I haven't even ironed the tablecloths yet. I'll be honest with you. I don't think I've ever sat down at a table and go, oh, that tablecloth's not ironed. I haven't. I'm just glad there's some food on the table. But boy, she's worried. And the more she works, the more she notices, look at Mary doing nothing. (laughs) When you get sisters together, it can be interesting sometimes. Mama Grace, my great-grandmother, and Aunt Maddie, my great-great-aunt, they lived together. Let me rephrase that. They lived in the same house. (laughs) It was a small house. They didn't do much together. It was a two-room house. They eat, they fixed their own meals. They had their own milk. They didn't even share a gallon of milk. One of them, I mean, they just, that's how they were. And boy, sisters sometimes, boy, they can just kind of, I can see right now, my sister, she's just in there sitting there, just gawking at Jesus. She comes to Jesus and says, basically, why don't you do something? He says, hey, this thing is needful. She's doing the better thing. Now, was he saying, now, we don't need to have a meal. Just cancel eating. No, that's not what he was saying. And there's a lot of things in life we need to accomplish and we need to get done, but there's something even more important, and it's abiding in Jesus Christ. And that's how you can go from, let's say, fixing that meal and being like, oh, no, it's got to be this, to going, it's going to be all right. Can I say this? I used to worry half to death about every single potluck meal we had at this church. I mean, I did. And do you know what I've learned to embrace? It's going to be all right. As long as we get together as a family and we're unified around Jesus Christ, it's going to be okay. Because guess what? If Jesus was glorified and I go home and have to stop at Burger King on the way home and get me a Junior Whopper. It'll be okay. You go, we can't have that happening. 
I ain't mad about it. Now, let me say this. I've never had to stop on the way home get me a Junior Whopper because I was hungry. I normally went home going, oh. My point is, rest in Jesus and it'll be okay. I used to worry half to death that I'd get up here to preach and I'd mess up. You say, how'd you get past messing up? I haven't. I realized one day, my job isn't to be perfect. Because if it is, I'm going to fail greatly. My job is to be faithful. And the only way for me to be faithful is to rest in Jesus Christ. Can I encourage you tonight? Settle in Jesus. You don't have to be frantic. And I know it's easy. I can get frantic. Pray for me tomorrow. I'm taking a group of junior hires to Nashville. <laughs> that can be frantic. But I've learned this. If I abide in Christ, the frantic can become calm. Abide in Him. Dear Lord, we thank You. First of all, we can't abide in You, but secondly, that it's because You invite us to. Pray, dear Lord, that we'll honor You, that we'll glorify You, that we'll lift you up in our life, that, Lord, we will, like that toddler settles in the arms of its mother, we'll settle in your arms, we'll rest in you. That we won't be cumbered about with much working, but, dear Lord, we'll rest in you. And as we rest in you, the outflowing of that, Lord, will be to accomplish much for your glory. But help us to have our priorities right, to honor you, to glorify you, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.